Hi, I'm Niall O'Carroll, and this is Inertia Creeps. Hey man, how you doing? What's going on? Ah, sure, living the dream. It's a, it's a joy to, to, to get a chance to talk to you like this, you know, rather than over a cold coffee. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I suppose the, 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 the reason I was, I was so excited to talk to you is, I mean, I love your take on what's going on in the world right now. And, you know, I, as, as I mentioned to you off air, uh, your, your, your tagline there of a, a seeker and speaker of truth. And you, you, as you say, your, 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 your f- personal perception probably is evolving all the time, but it's, it's something that is desperately needed in society right now I feel um and particularly when we're in the area of mental health and well-being and 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 areas that are wide open to uh I don't know tokenism um it it's nice to have conversations with people who passionately believe I mean one of the reasons I I call the show Inertia Creeps is that I kind of partially because I love the tune, but also because the very concept of doing nothing, getting greater, you know, and it's that famous Churchill line about the the only thing required for evil to to thrive is for good men to do nothing. And Mm. I feel like right now, um, you know, we, we, there's so many different avenues we can go down, whether it's looking at kind of mental health, whether it's looking at well-being, whether it's looking at, you know, the, the, the rise of far right nonsense around anti-immigration kind of philosophies and, you know, racism, like there's so many different areas. There's, there's, there's like, it's like every opportunity to create division is being grasped by very vocal minorities. But the problem is the 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 quiet majority don't shut it down and it just grows and grows and grows. And then we see some of the unrest we've seen across across Europe and the US. Um, so I suppose, uh, you know, lots to get into, loads to start from. I think I think the easiest place for us to start is if you give us just kind of a little bit of an insight, I mean, for, for me, I'm a big fan, you know, it's, it's not often you get to talk to a guy who's like particularly good at, at professional sport, particularly good at, at music, and then actually has, you know, a brain and, a, and, and PhD work behind him. Um, like there's so many layers and so many levels to, to, to Brezzi. Um, what, maybe give us a kind of an insight into to who you are for people who won't won't have heard of you. I am, um, I suppose, Niall. First and foremost, thanks for having me. And to start, uh, I'm somebody who always believed happiness lay in achievement, and hence spent my entire life seeking that and chasing it, and still feeling immensely unfulfilled in many different ways. And in many different ways, from an early age, I moved to I moved to Israel. Uh, when I was 13 with my dad, uh, he was in the United Nations. He was one of those incredible Irish defense forces who we now see doing the most important work on the Lebanese border because the Lebanese trust them. And uh, I was there in 1993 and there was a what now is referred to as the nine day war or operation accountability between Lebanon and, and Israel. The Hezbollah and IDF kicked off. We were in the middle of it. And that was from all I can remember, the starting point for what, when I felt something wasn't right within me. And I'm not into labels, as you're going to hear in this conversation. You can call it post-traumatic stress. You can call it whatever you want. It was, to me, a healthy human response to an unhealthy situation. And what was more unhealthy was the society I grew up in that didn't allow me even explore this. So I thought I'd asthma for many years because uh, I struggled with panic attacks. But I carry that into my professional rugby career, into my Gaelic football career, into my music, into my songwriting, into production, into television. I did it all and none of it made me happy. None of it actually answered any of the questions that I had going on in my head. And in fact, in many ways, just made it so much worse <clears throat> until I essentially had a breakdown and, and think, you know, that's that has led me on this journey of trying to discover what's going on in between my head. How is it influenced and how? Then I started getting very interested in other people and society and culture and psychology and sociology. And that led me back into academia because what I started to realize is we were kind of fucked from start 
like the, the conditioning of our culture, the conditioning of society, the conditioning of all of this has led us down a road into this neoliberal shit show that we now find ourselves in where humans are transactional. At the very best, we're transactional. And what that is doing to our collective psyches is so, so bad. And I don't think anyone fully realizes this. We've created a country that gained its independence in 1922. And, you know, I understand this, though. This is important for me to say. And I, I really understand why the Irish government have become so blinded by economics. Now, my initial degree was economics. It's a very blunt instrument to judge a society. But I can understand a country that was so ravished by poverty for so long and civil war and war and famine that when they saw the potential to become wealthy as a state or a country, that they went for it. But in that blinding pursuit of wealth, massive social issues were bubbling under the surface and they've missed them. And now we've created this. What we can now see is, is a pretty difficult social situation that's going to require serious leadership. And where is that leadership going to come from? You know, I don't think when I'm starting to look at Irish politics, I don't think that leadership's going to come from one individual. Uh, I don't think we have that type of politician yet are around. Like there are formidable people, whatever your politics, Mary Lou McDonald's a formidable woman. She's an incredible orator, incredible speaker, uh, you know, whether you agree with her politics or not. And there's many good politicians. I, I have to be really like people like Pascal Donahue, people I fundamentally disagree with policy wise, I'd still be happy to sit in a room with and chat to mm. and debate. And we're, we still have that in this country. I mean, if we lose that, we're just going to become America where they have, you know, armed guards with every politician. We need to keep that ability to engage with our politicians. And at the end of the day, fundamentally, I disagree with many of the ways we've done business as, as even the fact we call it Ireland Inc. pisses me off. Uh, could you imagine our like founders of the state? <laughs> imagine De Valera and Michael Collins knowing that we now refer to our country as Ireland Inc. That's neoliberalism. And you can blame that on Thatcher and Reagan. Mm. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that the, at the core of, of issues that are like, I mean, you're, you're talking about two leaders who dominated uh, Western politics in the, the early 1980s. And we're looking at, you know, 50 years later, the impact of, of those decisions. And one of the things I find kind of really interesting, and, and I know you, you've, you've, you've done a lot of work in mindfulness and a lot of work in the whole area of mental health and, and also in, in resilience. And it kind of makes me think that we've, I've always fascinated because you actually articulate things, you know, one of the reasons I wanted you on is you articulate things better than I do, but you, you, you articulated the whole myth around resilience. And I think it's, it's a knock on effect of exactly what you're saying of the, 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 the policies that we've pursued for, for this period of time has got us to a point where it's almost like um, organizations, companies, governments are telling you that the, that the onus is on you to fix your own problems um, and, in, in, and, and washing their hands of any responsibility then. So when, like, I mean, obviously an area that, that I really want to discuss with you is the whole, I, I mean, I want to say a better word than debacle that is the mental health support system in this country. But yeah, I think you can use that word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but it's it's you know this this perception and and like when you talk about mindfulness, I mean, I, I, like and 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 I'm a, I'm I'm a fan of the concept. I'm not necessarily a fan of the industry, um, but when you talk about mindfulness, it does bring that little layer of. Um, I mean, we have to look after ourselves because nobody else is going to do it for us, unfortunately, but it does then bring the onus back onto you again, doesn't it? And it's, it's like, maybe talk to me a little bit about your, that, that your thoughts around resilience and around kind of mental health and, and how as a society we're in the mess we're in. And, and actually it, not to exonerate our government of any blame, but Ireland isn't the only country that no. is getting their mental health support radically wrong. In fact, there's very That's few countries we, getting it right. We really have to talk about this because, you know, the focus of my PhD is ground zero mental health system. What does, what, if we were to start again, 
what would this look like? But back to the word resilience. Resilience has been corporatized. It's basically been created. So the wellness programs that we've now created are designed for one thing, to keep people in work or to get them back to work. That's what they're designed for. So they're basically, basically an extension of this neoliberal agenda. There's no question, you know, and it's easy to sell them because using words like, like resilience softens everything. It, it's a safe. We believe we're destigmatizing mental health because we're allowed now to speak about words like resilience and stress. But when you mention bipolar, schizophrenia, any of these, nobody wants to know. Nobody's ready for that yet. So what we've done with resilience is, you know, people go, I have a resilience program. What I'm starting to say to people about resilience is you've gone through pandemics, austerity, recessions, two wars now. Uh, you have cost of living crisis. It, there's been a perma crisis. Your entire liberty has been removed. Their autonomy has been uh, taken from you for a period of time. You're the very definition of resilience. If you're still standing after all of that, that's what it is. You don't need a self-help book. You don't need to be told to be more resilient. But in fact, nothing like I, I feel now the wellness industry is just an extension of neoliberalism and that's the problem it's a seven trillion dollar industry now I have to be very clear about this when I started this work I was knee deep in this shit I was the person going take com complete personal responsibility for you meditate eat well train which are really important highly important that we take personal responsibility and personal accountability but I never looked at the social forces. I never looked at the idea that society uh, has created this quite intensive place to be. And we've kind of created almost a default setting in people of hypervigilance where we always feel under threat. We always feel we're potentially not good enough. And then I put this up on some posts and people go, don't believe you. It's up to your own attitude. I'm like, grand, that's you now homogenizing personality types. So there's people out there who are trying fucking hard and they are hustling and they're putting everything they can into their life. There's maybe a couple and they're still looking at the rent at the end of the month going, I can't pay this. There's insecurity. There is lack of um, clarity and all of this stuff starts defeating. And then the wellness industry goes, I'll, I'll fix that. So what we've done is we've depoliticalized mental health. We've, we've said that mental health is purely the result of the individual. And if you look at our like as I said, the big focus of my PhD is about 150 years of intervention in Ireland when it comes to mental health. And when you go through that 150 years, the biggest single contributor to the mental health narrative is social forces, poverty, legal systems that had things like the dangerous lunatics act. So people were fecked into institutions who had nothing wrong with them and they were abused because families couldn't afford to feed their children. So they put them into institutions where the burden was on the state. And this just keeps feeding into the fact that and then what happened in mental health is the kind of what they refer to in the research as the medical men lobbied for power of the institutions and then said every mental health issue is biological. There's something wrong with your brain. Your brain is broken. Now, you know this as a psychologist, that more and more that 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 idea of this just being a, a, a biological problem is becoming more eroded by by the year in terms of research, you know. So what I'm trying to say is by using words like resilience and telling people to be more, you should not be resilient to what's going on in the world right now because that normalizes it. And what's going on in the world right now is not normal and it is overwhelming. So if anyone listening to this is overwhelmed and tired and exhausted, good, you should be. And that's a healthy response. It's not comfortable. No one enjoys it. But there's something nice in that there's a collectiveness in that if we can actually connect on that and be honest with each other instead of telling each other to fucking meditate it out out or drink take magnesium you know and i do not want to come across like i don't value these things massively i really do but we've siloed them they're over there you solve your own problem and then what that does is it gives a carte blanche to shit policy where people can't afford rent can't afford housing can't get access to healthcare in the richest country in europe that's how neo, neo, neoliberalism works. I it doesn't it doesn't work. And and it and 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 what's also fascinating for me is that it's the you you mentioned a few minutes ago about labeling, but I I have a huge problem with um, I, I I bring it up all the time. Like when we talk about say neurodiversity and the idea that you know there's twenty percent of the world's population fit into this category, and then the other eighty percent are typical. So 80% of the world's population are normal and 20% function in a different way, which to me is 
ludicrous. And it's also kind of like ignoring, again, it's it's, it's exonerating yourself of any responsibility as, as oh, that person's autistic, so they're, they're going to do this and that person's ADHD, so they're going to do this. Instead of us actually recognizing that as, as a society, instead of us, sell, instead of us differ, are, are creating labels to make us all different, so we're all off in our little corners, that we're all just surviving whatever's going on in the world and we're all just dealing with the shit that's in front of us. And we all have our responsibilities and we also have a, a right to expect some sort of of um, acknowledgement within your workplace of, of the way you work and, and the idea that we can actually go to work and do it in a place that's happy. And if there's one good thing that's come out of the, the pandemic, um, and there probably aren't that many, but it's there's a generation of kids coming into the workplace now who want not a myth or a nonsense about work-life balance, but actually want their work to feed their lives and allow them to go and do the things they want to do with their lives. Um, and work is going to have to accommodate that. So, you know, if you want to hire the best people coming out of college and you want to hire the people who are going to do great things for your business, you're going to have to adapt and give them the opportunities to, 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 to work in a manner that, that suits them. But it all comes back down to the fact that we've, we've always had labels. It's always been like, let's differentiate and, and increasingly, I mean, you mentioned America there and, the thing that's most depressing, like uh, having lived there for many years and, 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 and in North America for many years, the thing that's most depressing is the fact that there is no middle ground in America anymore. You're either crazy liberal or you're lunatic right wing. And there doesn't seem to be any capacity for a conversation about, you know, I, I tried to have a conversation a few months back um, with a couple of American friends about Donald Trump. And, uh, you know, not, not a human being I'm a particular fan of, but my attitude was there's this huge number of people in, in this country that voted for him. So there has to be something about his policies that made sense to them, that like there has to be something he did that made him work. And it was very difficult to have a conversation that didn't, did, you know, collapse into all oh, loony liberals or mad right wing. It was very hard to have just a rational conversation of it. Look, was, you know, was there anything that was good or bad or indifferent or whatever? Um, and that to me, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm interested. Like, I love the research you're doing. I love the take you have on, on society because I fundamentally agree. And I, I don't, I, I, I have all sorts of questions about um, economics ruling the world and why, um, certain things like recession has to happen and inflation has to happen and who's dictating why these things happen. And, and, um, there's, there's a whole whack of things that, that, that need to be challenged, I feel. But what I try to do is have these conversations from the point of view of let's not descend into the loony liberals and the, the crazy far rights and let's actually have some data-driven, interesting conversations that aren't about our differences, but about who we are as human beings and how we make the, make things better. And I think that's kind of at, at the heart where you're coming from, isn't it? It's the the, the recognizing humans rather than the, the differences. Uh, I, I think also, ironically, as you use the word loon, loony, uh, with mm. the fact that we created the, you know, district lunatic asylums and what lunatic yeah. means. And we throw those words around quite, you know, easily uh we saw our drew harris say it after the riots you know lunatic far right i i i i have to first and foremost i think that word needs to be really looked at i think that is that's that is another example of of a stereotypical language when it comes to mental health but that's well, just i think i think it's a cartoon like it's like looney tunes it is. right it's, it's, no, it's, it a is. And, it's a cartoon but, description of a of a of a people really but the, the the way that word was abused in the past and so you talk about labels there was two labels when they opened the institutions in ireland and in kind of 1817 was the first kind of opening there was uh, melancholy and delusions there were the two you'd pick pick either one melancholy depression and delusions would be you know, anxiety or, or, or severe anxiety, often in many cases, uh, post postnatal depression was a big one where, where women really struggled after birth in a very poor country. So when you feed all these labels in and then what happened is the DSM came along and kind of categorized all these 
these labels for mental health disorders and put them into a book, which was probably very helpful for people who weren't quite sure how to actually treat this. And psychiatry uses this term a lot. And I, I work a lot with Brendan Kelly, an amazing man, Trinity, uh, head of psychiatry in Trinity. He called a lot of what psychiatry was trying to do uh, therapeutic enthusiasm or therapeutic desperation was what he often refers to it is that they were trying so hard. And I believe that I do believe that they were trying to figure out how did they treat madness and the less it worked, the more frustrated they got. And they saw things like lobotomies and you saw things like malaria, yeah, instant coma therapy, all these really barbaric, horrific treatments. And then medicine came along the fifties and we started medicalizing it and that, oh, maybe this is what's going to solve the problem. But medicine has never solved the problem. It numbs the problem. That's what it does. But it also just treats the problem as a biological problem. Medicine is very important. There's a, there's a place. There absolutely is a place for it. But what the DSM did was started to create disorder out of, out of thin air. They literally sat in a room and started writing these disorders and kind of putting them together. And, and there's an amazing book by James Davies called Sedated and another book he wrote called Cracked. And James Davies is one of the top academics in, in the world, I, I would argue. And he utterly debunks the DSM. It's like there is no blood markers or biological blood markers only for Alzheimer's is the only one with, within the book. Yet it's, it's the Bible for how we treat mental health. So that's just a the, this is what I'm looking at is why why. So what we've created in Ireland around mental health, it crossed the world, and you're absolutely correct, it has crossed the world, is what is referred to as path dependency theory. So we basically have kept doing the same thing, and the more we walk down that path, the harder it came to turn away. Now we're in a complete new place where there's an, there's everybody wants a diagnosis. There's a show on Netflix now called The Psychopath Life Coach. We've gamified this. We've gamified these labels. We're throwing them in. There's people on TikTok saying there's people self-diagnosing on TikTok. And the problem, the reason they're doing that is they can't get access to proper care. They can't get access to proper assessment. So what I focus on and things like ADHD and autism, these are very real things with a lot of people. These are very difficult for people to deal with. But what I'm trying to promote is early assessment, early intervention, early supports. And rather than changing that person, change the society they live in to actually not see it as something that is fundamentally uh, wrong. It's just, you know, so I, I think this to me is where, where the focus of my, how do you disrupt that path dependency theory? The way I believe we disrupt it is through early intervention and early prevention in primary schools where you start teaching young children how to navigate emotion, express it, deal with it, speak about it. Um, and all these, what's the function of all that stuff? And what's more important is we can't just lob that on teachers. We cannot lob that. We have Norma Foley going, we're going to put psychologists in schools. Fucking great, Norma. Where are you going to get them? How are you going to pay for them? How are you going to resource them? It's all kite flying. There is no joined up thinking across the board. And the, the people in the firing line of this are the people who work in that system, who are fundamentally world class at what they do, most of them. Hmm. And they're, they're sitting here filling out feckin' files and, co and and still using Windows 92, probably. We need to get to a point where we don't accept this. Taxpayers in Ireland go, actually, no, no more. This is this like the CAMS report. If anyone listening to this, go and download the CAMS report, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services report that was published in July, I believe. Uh, incredible piece of work by Susan Finnerty. Read that. Read that. It's a couple of pages. Read that. And if, it, if you don't fall apart after reading it and it doesn't make you go, we have to do something now and we got to actually be radical here and we got to create an entire paradigm shift in how we look at mental health in this country and other, other social issues. If that doesn't bring you to your knees, I don't know what will. But that was the catalyst for me to do my PhD because I was just fucking sick of watching this and nothing happening. But yeah, back to the idea that... Labels, we have to be careful about them because a lot of people want them because it allows them to make sense of the world. What I want to do is allow the world needs to make sense for everybody. That's that's where we got to get to. And it's going to take time. And that's ultimately what I'm looking at more is the sociological things. How can we make this a world that doesn't feel so overwhelming for people? But I mean, what a, I mean, what a cause. And it, it, like everybody has 
you know, I'm I'm a great believer in in even with with the training I do. It's about measuring the impact of it. Don't just do something just to, like it's easy to take the check, go in, deliver a talk, and then leave. If it has no impact, what's the point? So, mm. like understanding impact. But you you talk about labels and you talk about making sense. Like for me, I struggled in traditional education. Um, and I, I went to a rugby school, I played rugby in school, and that was kind of like my escape from, you know, the, the, the getting my head around the way. I always felt like I was smart, but I didn't feel like education, the, the, the education system and schooling led me to believe I was. Um, and I was really poor at exams and stuff, even though I would know a lot of the answers, I wouldn't always do well at exams. And, and I only found out about six months ago, I am... Um, having waited a long time and a waiting list to get an assessment um, and paid a lot of money, I finally got uh, an assessment that, uh, that I have ADHD. And, and there's a whole movement about kind of, oh, Jesus, everyone is ADHD these days. And I'm kind of looking at it going, well, what if they do? Like for me, it was a really interesting diagnosis because it allowed me to make sense, as you said, of certain challenges I've had in my life, but it also gave me some information around things I can do to manage it better. And I'm not a fan of, of medication. I don't believe in medication as being the solution to a problem. Um, and that's not to dismiss anybody who has gotten relief from medication. Um, and I've looked into the whole kind of idea of, of diet and physical exercise and, 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 you know, you know, understanding peaks and troughs of energy levels and focus and all those kind of things. Um, what I do struggle with is, you know, I, I, I went to an ADHD conference in, in the UK back in the summer um, and it was a fascinating experience. Some really, really smart people there with some really interesting research. And then half the room were people who were just angry and just wanted a cause to be angry and probably had other labels that made them different. And this was just another one they could jump under and, and, and justify their anger. And then there was probably another half of the room who genuinely wanted to learn, understand and figure out how this is going to, this is going to change things. But what I, what I did feel afterwards, like, and, 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 and thinking about it from, from, you know, I do a lot of work in, in the kind of the, the, the corporate leadership space, which is, can be very frustrating because of everything you've said and, and, and the, the understanding that very, very few of the companies who come and talk to you about doing work with them genuinely want to change something and they're looking to just, you know, do the, the token gesture stuff. Um, but understanding for me, I just made me realize, I suppose, that the labels are relevant because I'm still the same individual going in to do my work and, and, and I still have, you know, the same ways of working. And there are things that because of my ADHD allow me to be better at something than maybe than, than, than if, I, if I didn't have a diagnosis, I don't know. But then there's also the fact that there are challenges. Well, we all have challenges and, and I feel like one of the mistakes, one... I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of a way to frame it, but one of the one of, one of the, the areas that I think the, the the corporate world really falls down in is, well, for one thing, I don't think it truly gives a shit about the individuals working there. You have, you know, individual. Some some companies will 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 be different, but in the main, they don't really care. Um, so the idea of creating an environment where whether you're autistic, whether you've got ADHD, whether you're dyslexic, whether you're a immigrant living in a different country kind of getting used to language and culture and food and all the things that are different like what i feel is we're brilliant at talking about diversity we're great at talking about we should you know equality what we're really shit at is acknowledging what equity looks like and what inclusion looks like and and mm -hmm. like what are your what are your somebody coming from from a different culture, whether you're racially different, whether you're, you know, transgender, whether you're sexually different. If a company genuinely wants you to have an environment that allows you to thrive, then they've got to, they've got to listen to wh where your sticking points are, your pain points are, and help you to fix them. Um, 
And I just feel like what we do right now is we just take a label and that then gives us a, an excuse. So, for example, if if you've got a, a kid who's on the autistic spectrum, there'll be an element of give them a set of headphones, send them off into a corner on their own. And totally, I mean, I even, I, I even, I brought in an expert on neurodiversity when I, in my last job where I was kind of part of my job was to find experts to talk on all this well-being, um, well-being stuff that, 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 you know, if people genuinely wanted to change, it would be very cool, but actually you just end up doing stick in plaster stuff. But I brought in an expert to talk about neurodiversity. And the first question they were asked by the director of people and culture in this company, the first question they were asked was, if somebody's neurodiverse, are they better off working in IT? And I was like, Jesus Christ, where do, where do we go with that? Like, so that's the level of understanding of the person who was, had held the budget for all this well-being stuff. So anyway, that's, that's a rant on my part, but, but just from your perspective, because there's a direct link, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but there's a direct link like from, from, obviously I've been doing an awful lot of research into ADHD to understand it all, but there's a direct link between ADHD and, and depression and mental health problems. And I'm assuming there's, well, there's definitely a direct, there's a direct link between all of these issues, all of these diverse issues and mental health problems, because anything that identifies you as being different and you get no support and you're isolated is, it has a tendency to lead you into a dangerous place. What's the solution, I suppose, you know, and you're, 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 you're the man who's, who's got the research that's going to save society. Well, I, so. I don't, I don't, <laughs> but like what I do know, the starting point is that if somebody is finding their world overwhelming, it's affecting their relationships, it's affecting how they interact with their community. It's inter it's affecting how they, you know, you know, sitting in a classroom can be immensely overwhelming for them. That's why early, early prevention and early intervention and early assessment is so crucial. What's happening is a lot of younger people are waiting two years before they're even assessed, before there's even a set of structures put in place to support that young person. So, of course, when they become adults, they're, they are angry because they've 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 had so many years of feeling that there's just something that they couldn't quite understand within themselves and how o overwhelming that become and anxiety inducing that can become and how it can affect your mood. and course it can and i think this I, a prime example is i interviewed him, one of the most incredible human beings i have spoke to on my podcast davin godfrey davin was one of the young men who came forward uh for the south uh, the kerry cams uh debacle the maskey report and he was put on seven different types of medication without a mental health diagnosis no mental health diagnosis he's had many operations now to remove his breasts because he put on so many so much weight he was one of the people who was affected by this and his actual diagnosis was autism. He, he really struggled with certain elements of his life that nobody was helping him with. So this is you asked me what the solution is. I don't know, but I absolutely think I can not tell you my hypothesis is that I believe early prevention can disrupt the path dependency of our current mental health system. That's what I believe. But I have to see that. I have to show that research and I have to prove it to a point. But the, but I, I think anybody, if you look at our our budgets, so little of our budgets go into early prevention. And the problem is early prevention is just to start. Once you assess, you then have to create. But the problem is we're trying to create intervention without, you know, without knowing what the problem is. So then we got to ask the question is, is there more younger people getting getting overwhelmed by the world is the world that we have the the kind of the mass levels of technology how is that influencing the brain is that causing young people to feel hyper vigilant all the time is that then feeding into their ability to, to maintain focus this is all stuff we got to look at but the way i look at it is when you look at health budgets i think now a good government a good go good governance approach would look would look at the health budgets in two ways. It would look at the crisis model. How do we how do we fund a crisis model so we can support people who find themselves getting sick, unfortunately, and how do we help them? But also a prevention model. What is the model we create to stop people getting to these points of crisis, whether it's mental or physical health? And like these Stay Healthy Ireland HSE campaigns, they're grand, but they're just posters. That's really all they end up becoming and people don't engage with them. So we have to actually really think about this. Uh, so hopefully I look at all these different things that young people are dealing with. I would love to see if if we let's paint the picture differently here. You're you're six and you, you you're struggling in class. You're, you're misbehaving. You're you're not able to do your homework. You're finding it really difficult to socialize sometimes uh, you 
you know, you're, you're, you're not sleeping too well. And the minute that starts to happen, the mother goes, you know, I would, I'd like to get this looked at. And straight away we go, right, we have a community care system here. We're going to bring them in and we're going to have an assessment here. Also, the assessments, the, the assessments that we do use for these have to be looked at as well. They're very old. They, they, they you know, they're, they're good, but they're old. Maybe we need to look at reworking these assessment models. And then you assess this young person. You find, right, this person is, you know, there's, there's, there's neurodivergence here. There's, there's the, the autism spectrum. Okay, grand. Now we have n- knowledge. Then you get into under the bonnet a little bit with that and you find out what are the things that are causing the anxiety, the overwhelm, and then you just start designing the solutions for those. And in a way, we do that. We have SNAs, we have all these stuff. But I just wonder at what level is it taken seriously? Are we resourcing SNAs the way they should be resourced? Are we developing community care systems? They probably exist. But one thing Ireland is wonderful at, right, unbelievably at, good at, is policy. We're very bad at implementation. And if you look at, say, sharing the vision, our vision for change, our mental health policy, some of it was really good. We haven't. But what I started to realize with my work, policy is just the kind of layers. It's a top, top layer stuff. Underneath that, you got power dynamics. Who's pulling the strings in the economic, econ, economics in the health system? Who pulls the strings there? Who's the power dynamics? And you have relationships. Unless you're getting down there and into the mental models then, which is what do people actually think about this? What does the electorate think about this? Then policy is just a nice piece of paper. It's actually, poor, it's, it's generally not very effective. So change, effective change is probably the most difficult thing that can ever happen. It is so difficult. But one thing I will say is Ireland are bloody good at. We're good at it. We've, we, we, you know, we, we put the smoking ban in, you know, repeal, we had the, the marriage equality, we had all these, we're good at social change. But I think mental health and health feel sticky to us. And it feels sticky. And the reason you have to ask yourself why it feels sticky is you have to ask yourself, what are the power dynamics at play here? Mm. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I've seen it personally. Um, you know, the parents who are, sorry, the kids who get the best supports around say neurodivergence in in school are generally the kids of parents who fight the hardest and that there are there are supports on offer but if if you're somebody who just accepts the school saying no we don't have anything then you don't get anything and 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 not every school is as proactive in in treating these 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 challenges seriously i mean i had a, a teacher tell me um send me a message saying great news your daughter doesn't need extra support for her exam and i'm kind of going why is it great news it wouldn't be bad news if she didn't you know or you know (laughs) the thing to me is and it shouldn't be up to the teacher or the school it should just be a systematic approach to it's a systematic approach that's designed for for educational schools now the problem you have schools nyla is like i i work with these teachers you know when norma foley came in and said we're going to put psychologists or therapists in schools a wonderful idea, great idea. Like, like we all agree with that. But the the issue is when you actually start doing the money and the the, the budget and that, it's pittens. Like the t- the schools are like, we can't do it. We can't get them. We can't afford them. And and the Illus for Life programs, which are programs which are kind of early prevention programs for schools and primary schools, uh, we we even look at, you know, we're trying to educate, and we're trying to make it easy for teachers to do it and safe and evidence based. But the problem is. We are putting plasters and bullet wounds at the moment uh, in terms of uh, our approach here. And I think the reality is the paradigm shift we need, I think. And as I said, this is just me evolving how I think of this. I, I think we need to stop looking at everything through the lens of biology and just go, why are people overwhelmed? Why are they very anxious? Why do they find the world overwhelming? What are the social elements of the world? And every single time, every point in history, we thought we had the solution. Mental health, we thought the solution was going to be lobotomy. Let's put nails in their brains. Let's just drug them so much they can't move. Let's just give them malaria. Let's, I have it, insulin coma therapy. Let's give them so much insulin that they go, that they're, they're knocked out and then we'll, we'll get them back and that'll sort it. Then we had ECT and that ECT is a very kind of, I suppose, controversial one because there is efficacy. There's people saying that there is elements of it working, but actually when you do the real digging on that, and you look, uh, you know, you wonder how much efficacy can you really say when it comes to electrocuting people, which is what the ECT is, but it's mu- much less barbaric than it was where they used to do it with anesthetic. You know, 
But this is this is legacy stuff that still actually exists within our mental health systems. And we still believe that anyone coming in the door who has just is on the floor with depression, that their brain is broken. That's why they're on the floor. No one ever go, what, what happened to you? What happened to you? What, 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 that, that's the first question I believe that needs to be asked when it comes to somebody who's on the floor. And then we got to look at multidisciplinary options. And that's also part of my research is like, you know, in some cases, somebody's at such an acute level of distress, they need to be medicalized. You need to help them. You need to get them supported. But we need to look at more sustainable models of care and the government has to open their eyes to it. I couldn't agree more. And 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 actually, when it, I mean, if you think of it logically and, and you listed some of the global events that have impacted us all, even in the last, you know, decade, um, there's been some... Uh, sig- like so many significant events that would cause trauma and, and upset. And, and it's very easy for people to kind of dismiss the, the, the current generation or the, the generation alphas as they're called now, or the generation Zs and, and they call them the snowflakes and whatever. I mean, growing up with so much access to information, to negative information, to constantly being bombarded with information about every single thing that's happening in the world. Um, like why wouldn't there be a greater instance of anxiety in, in the generation that are coming through right now? Um, I suppose, if I was to look at it from a, a, a solution point of view, because I, I fundamentally agree with everything you're saying about uh, access to to resources and getting it earlier and all of those things all make sense. And I think I actually feel sorry for the the, the generation of kids coming through school at the moment because I think it's, 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 it's an appalling time. I and mean, they lost two years of their lives. To, I mean, at one point you couldn't leave your house, you know, um, they're looking at all the, the, the information and, and also they're being blamed. I mean, throughout the pandemic, the, the COVID pandemic, it was the kids who were being blamed for spreading it. You know, it was like, it was constant negativity. Um, but if you were to look at it from the point of view of, you know, going into the, the, the corporate world and, you know, you can have conversation around leadership training and there are individuals who genuinely care and genuinely want to do things better. And you have a whole generation or, or multiple younger generations coming into the workforce now who are much more comfortable talking about their emotions and talking about mental health issues than the generation that went before them, which means that leaders and managers in, in organizations aren't equipped when somebody says that I'm, you know, I need a mental health day or I'm having a really difficult time or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with anxiety or whatever the case may be. What, what do you think is the solution? If, it, if you're a, a company and allowing for the fact that there are people who want to do good in the world, if you're a company where you want to, to improve the lives of the people working for you and, and I, I mean, look, obviously productivity becomes uh, almost like a a negative word then because it's, it's, it is linked to the whole neoliberal philosophy that you, that you've been talking about. But if you want to do something good for your people, what, what, what do you think is a starting point uh, allowing for the fact that, you know, the younger generations coming into the workforce are much more likely to share with you that they're struggling? Yeah, I think, I think really important here that, we all know that the job of a corporate organization is is productivity and profit, and that's absolutely okay. That's there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a bad word at all. Like we all enjoy the 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 most of us enjoy elements of capitalism and and productivity in our world. We do. We have a beautiful country. We live in a generally there's huge social problems that we need to address, but we still live in a country where it's relatively safe. There's elements, but. You know, rather than kind of just go boo economics, we need economics. That's how societies work. It's how we, that's how we fund the state. That's how we, you know, I think the problem is when that economics doesn't filter down and doesn't filter into the microeconomics of people's households, that's when it gets people pissed off. And that's where we're at. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is this isn't about boo or like I massively value innovation. I, I value entrepreneurship. I value massively successful, profitable companies when they're not doing it and rinsing the world of its resources and of the people within it. And there are businesses that do that and organizations that do that. But the one thing I think we have to be very careful with in the corporate world that I see more and more slipping in is the word mental illness. Even some of the programs that people do for mental health 
refer to things like stress as mental health illness. Um, now, without context, we don't know what it is. Without knowledge, but stress is not mental illness. Uh, chronic, overwhelming, s- compulsive stress and OCD and things like that. We got to be re- that that that's an entirely different conversation than somebody who's just stressed from work. So I think the 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 every corporate organization needs to be much more wary of using that word because that pathologicalizes what generally is quite normal human responses. Somebody might be overwhelmed by their job. There might be something going on at home for them. There might be sh- some shit going on. Their mum might be sick. Yeah, you know, and they're carrying all of that. Relationships, financial stresses, you know, and everything fucking parks itself in front of them, and then like, oh my god, the world is overwhelming, and it is overwhelming, and then we go, you've an illness, and you pathologicalize it, and I think we have to be really careful with that. I really do. Oh, I I couldn't agree more. And the more I I look into this work and do this work, the more I feel that it's you know sometimes it's referred to. You know, it's referred to in the academic literature. It's referred to as the market for deviance. That's what they use. This type of language are the currency of crazy. So it's basically creating a market by calling mental health illness, mental health illness, mental health illness. It creates a market. And and the, the only way that that market, uh, t- uh, Mark Fisher wrote an amazing essay called The Privatization of Stress. And he said, the privatization of stress is be- is elegant in its brutal efficiency. Capital makes us ill and multi- multinational pharmaceutical companies give us the drugs to make us better. And this is what we do. We just create this cycle rather than going, actually, what you're f- experiencing, say, Michael, your dad passed away. You're, you're in a difficult relationship. You're a bit of job insecurity here. What you need is is not to be called, told you have an illness. And, and there might be, it might well have one, you know, but just to say that because it says it on a piece of paper that was on a program that the work HR girl had, is it's, it's nonsense and it's dangerous. And it's actually just creating... It's rational dishonesty is what, what I call it. Um, but you asked me what is the starting point. So the, the kind of gold standard for me of kind of surveying and research is Gallup. Gallup is where I go for most of my kind of information on wellness and well-being and the stats behind it. And they're very good because they they look at stress and overwhelm sociologically and psychologically. They look at the different elements of stuff all around us. And they had five pillars of well-being. So they have a, they kind of, when I kind of read everything, I'm just going to get them here for you, just to to read them out, what those five pillars. So what people need to kind of, to feel like the world isn't overwhelming to them. And you'd be surprised by them. Um, What those five things are, hold on, are career. So having a fulfilling and engaging job that allows for personal growth and development. So let's take that one. So if you're in a job where AI is now starting to take over, you're not quite sure your place in that job. You're not quite sure of your clarity of what you do. Is there enough purpose in what you do? That will affect you. The second one is social. So having strong relationships and a supportive network of family and friends. That's crucially important. The third is financial, feeling secure and satisfied with one's economic situation and being able to manage financial stressors. Now, tell me that's something a lot of people are experiencing, say, in Dublin City at the moment, where they they don't know if they're going to have, you know, there is job insecurity. Some of them are on zero hour contracts. Some of them are on gig economy bullshit and then have to pay rent. So the second, the fourth one is physical. So having good health and energy to engage in daily activities, exercise, and maintain a healthy lifestyle. There's some people who don't have that. They have autoimmune diseases. They might have other issues that allows them not to be able to physically to partake the way they want to. And then the fifth is community, feeling a sense of belonging and connection to one's community and having opportunities to contribute and make a difference. Now, community is an interesting one because neoliberalism massively promotes individualism. It does, it's, mm-hmm. it's every man and every woman for themselves. It's hustle economy. It's like, I, you know, I got up at two o'clock in the morning, went to the gym, two days work before six o'clock. I injected some green shit into my balls at seven o'clock and that's the that's the neoliberal bullshit that we get bombarded with. So community becomes really irrelevant because it's just you hustling, trying to make it to the top. So there are five pillars of well-being. Mm. And then when you start to think of it like that, if those are kind of relatively understood, then you start looking into other things. And then the issue with things like relationships and support. So if your career is not really, there's lack of purpose, there's lack of clarity there, that's going to affect into your social issue where you, you're not quite sure of your relationships with your family or friends. You start to question your self-worth because you have a job that you don't believe is really delivering anything to anything. And then that can feed into your financial insecurity and then physical and then your community, you start to disengage. So all of this stuff 
so the one thing when you take all of that, that I think the best thing you can do to start a well being in a in a in a job is clarity, clarity, clarity. Give people clarity. Let them know where they stand, what it is we're doing. Give them as much security as you can. Because I spoke to a CEO of one of the biggest companies in the country right now, an incredible woman doing immense work. And I said, after the five years we've had, where all we've had was insecurity and lack of clarity and lack of stability, the more you can provide that to your teams, the more they'll start to build upon that. And then you can build in your meditation stuff and your, you know, walking around. Like all this stuff is important, but we have to look at this. The, the social conditions that we've had for the last five or six years have been very unstable and very overwhelming. And a lot of people feel that all the time in that sense. So I'm not, no organization can give people perfect clarity and perfect security, but be aware of how important it is to people. And this is the stuff I'm starting to understand. And also, you know, EAPs are great. You know, a lot of people aren't using them the way they should be using them because people are terrified of what therapy is. There's no education on what therapy is. We just go, it's therapy. What type of therapy? What therapy should I be using for the issues that I might be facing? My daughter's struggling, which is in fact, it's affecting me. And everyone goes, just do CBT. Like CBT doesn't solve everybody's fucking mm. problems. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it can help some people, but then there's things like schema therapy, gestalt psychology, other areas. But who's going to know that? I barely know it and I've studied it. So you can't expect some young, you know, young person who's 23 is struggling in work and they go, use your EAP. We need to start educating people on the types of therapies that can help them and support them. But we need to understand that their environment and their social environment has massive influence on that. And the big thing for me is, is just feeling like you're, you're worth something to the company and the organization to believe that you're contributing, that you are helping. And that's important. And it's OK that these businesses want to make loads of money. It's always, you know, capitalism, that's what it is. But it doesn't have to be at all costs. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to get through to people. And it's a it's a fantastic um it it it's a great conversation because it's it's that's exactly it. It's 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 you know, I suppose at the heart of it all you're making your 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 the whole conversation is about being that little bit more human, right? And it's um I find that and 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 you mentioned Gallup and the Gallup polls back it up, but I find that the um, one of the, the the fundamental drivers of of m mental health struggles in the workplace are relationships with with managers and leaders, and and it all comes down to I mean the the best environments I've worked in and 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 whether it's sporting or or corporate, the best environments I have worked in were leaders who understood how to actually communicate openly. And there's a great guy, a guy, I don't know if you've come across him, John Amici is a, 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 a leading psychologist and he played uh, professional basketball for years. I actually mentioned him in, an, in, in another interview recently, but he um, he's a guy I have a great regard for as a psychologist in, he's quite a disruptor in the way he views things, but he just said that people, people don't have uh, honest conversation with conversations with each other in the workplace because it's it's emotionally expensive and they avoid giving each other feedback having difficult conversations and I feel like that in itself is a very simple place for leaders to start with making the the workplace but healthier I think leaders also do this thing uh, that I, I, I've noticed is they homogenize personality types. So they assume every personality is going to want to go out and do the, you know, the team building thing. And some do, but some people are actually immensely insular. They're, they And they're comfortable with that. That's they're a bit, they're a bit shyer. They, they're, it's about recognizing the type of personality type that you're, you're, and this is emotional intelligence. This is what they need to really grasp is understanding the personality types, types of your teams understanding how they respond to certain stimulus. Like, I'll give you an example of that. When I played rugby, I believed that everybody in that dressing room needed people punching walls and headbutting walls and screaming before we went out on the pitch. And I remember my, my captain at the time, an amazing guy, Shane, in UCD, took me aside. He goes, you know, Niall, not everybody responds to that. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, we're about going out to play rugby. We've got to kick the shit out. Like, no, no, no. Some people actually are very comfortable just sitting with, and I mean, and that was incredible learning because I just assumed everybody in the team was the same as me. 
and they weren't. So I think personality type is really important, understanding how people respond to things. And also, I think it, it is the idea that there's, there is a slight perception that it's up to the organization to solve all everyone's problems, and it isn't. And I did a, a an interesting uh, keynote to a group of uh, maybe 400 doctors. And one of the questions when it was over was like, you know, how do we, I, I said, you shouldn't be so arrogant to believe that you can solve everybody's problems. A lot of people's problems aren't because there's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with their environment and their society or their their, their surrounding area. And, you know, and I was saying that in a really respectful way to doctors. Doctors are always expected to solve all these problems. And in many ways they can and in other ways they can't. And I think it's it's the same with leaders. But for me, the one thing I always say to them, it's a brilliant research by Albert Morabian, who who basically, it's about communication. He says about 7% of meaning is assigned to words and 93% of meaning is assigned to tone of voice and to body language. And what he's essentially saying is you can't bullshit people. If you're not authentic and you're not showing up properly, you can throw as many sexy words as you want that you read in an Adam, you know, an Adam Grant book or, a, you know, a fucking Tony Robbins lecture. It means nothing to them unless you actually mean it. So t- the showing up authentically is a word you hear a lot. But actually, the reason you have to do it is because humans are so good at smelling bullshit. And <laughs> it's, it, it's our greatest. I think it's our greatest asset. We're so good yeah. at thinking out bullshit. I'll give you another example of that. A, a leading coach that I was under lied to one player in the squad. One player lied to them and he lost the entire dressing room because of that. No, never got them back because once that's gone, it's gone. So authenticity is important in leadership and understanding. I call it lens processing. So try to look at the world through other people's points of view, even if you don't like them or you don't really enjoy their company or they're amazing, whoever they are to you, try and wear their lens for a second. And that's emotional intelligence. And even if you don't care, it makes you more effective at delivering what your organization wants, which is profit. But it also makes the f- person you're, you're you're looking at the world through for them. You're making them feel like they're they are part of something here and they are contributing. So, yeah, it's it's it's, and I'm not I, I'm not given an answer here. I'd never worked in a corporate company. That's the other thing. I don't have some. Yeah, like, but there's an authenticity in that, right? No, I've no, I worked in the bank for seven days and I fired myself after giving <laughs> Tyler. I gave a Tyler a loan for <laughs> twenty vans. He knew mon- he had no money in his bank account. I was like, oh, maybe not. So I've worked in the bank, but I, I, I I've worked with many, many teams and leaders and, and and organizations and CEOs. I've worked with them. I sat with them in rooms. They're humans. They always have somebody over top of them screaming at them. That's the other thing I always think. There's always somebody above you, and whether it's the the IMF, the bank, the board, whoever it is. There's always somebody. Um, so yeah, I do think it's it's the whole back to this neoliberal thing, and I think it's it's important to point out. People go neoliberalism is like there's a better way. There's a thing called the third way, and and the third way is. Some are in the middle of old capitalism and neoliberalism, which is referred to as new capitalism, where they, you know, for anyone listening to this, go, what the fuck is this about? It's basically when you've said the government will not intervene in the market. The market will solve all problems. The market dictates and we can't regulate market, which is why we had housing crisis. It's why we had the the recession. It's why we we now have 4,000 homeless children in the country. It's because the government were like, "Mm, can't regulate that shit. And when you don't regulate profit, it becomes very dangerous. So anyway, that's just one element of what neoliberalism is. So the third way is the fact that we start investing. And then you, you have people who are pro-neoliberal going, well, you know, there's people who won't want work, who don't work and they they, they give you off this the society. Very few, very few. And if you want to use that logic, there's an abundance of absolute arseholes at the very top too. But not everybody is. There's some very good people who've succeeded very well and didn't be ruthless and horrible and have succeeded and live in nice homes because they worked hard. In the same way you think that just because there's a few people who won't work because they're getting social welfare. But then that that mindset is Thatcherism. And Thatcherism believed that if you weren't, you know, if you, if you were living in poverty, it's because you just were lazy. That's how she actually believed. And you can see it and you can hear it in the language of our politicians. You can hear that Thatcherism 
And the reality is it's a complete reductionism because you're not looking at the reality of vicious circles of poverty and inequality and inequity that do exist. And the more you drive neoliberalism, the more you drive inequality. And inequality is bad for everybody. It is bad for everybody. It isn't just bad for the people who are a direct consequence of it. It's bad for, for the middle class. It's bad for, it is bad for the upper class. Nobody, I, I don't believe, I, I, I don't buy into the fact that, you know, we divide classes like this and we, you know, we stereotype them. Then we go, the rich people are, don't care about the world and they're, they're just living off and they're blind to the reality of the world. I, I know some really wealthy people who are the complete opposite of that and care fucking greatly for the world. And I know some, you know, people who have, have are struggling just to pay rent and have three or four children who feel that the the world has been against them from day one. And it has, you know, and, and that's the reality. And I know people don't want to hear that, but in a, in the richest country in Europe, the wealthiest country in Europe, with the fastest growing GDP, with the with, you know, zero unemployment, the more you hear that when you're living in a home and trying to feed your children, the more you feel gaslit by the state the more you feel that you're doing something wrong, the more that affects your self-worth, your confidence, your ability to believe in yourself, the ability to get yourself out of this position. And it just, and then we, in the midst of it all, we just go, you have a broken brain. I'm like, no, actually, I don't know if you do. I think, I think if we can start looking at social issues in a new way, and I do believe there's politicians there that care about it. I don't believe they're all the big bad wolves. Uh, I think some of them, some of them are. But I think this area, especially mental health, it just scares them too much. They don't think there's a solution. They don't think there's an answer. They don't see really worth investing in because they just think it's always existed and it's always been the way it's been. And that's just nonsense. Yeah. And it's... Uh... It's a good place to leave it. It's, it's, you know, I could talk for hours with you, man. It, it, it's absolutely, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with more uh, with, with, I, I couldn't agree anymore with everything you said really. But, um, one, one, one actual parting question, um, you mentioned the, the trauma as a kid in a war zone and you mentioned the, the challenges you had through, you know, the pursuit of happiness and sport and in music and. And, you know, it should be said you were very successful in, 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 in both of those. And, you know, in academia, again, success is following you. And, you know, you're, you're a very popular speaker in this area. You're a guy who's obviously got a, a, a huge future, you know, with the corporate world talking about this kind of stuff. So many good things going on. But I thought it was quite interesting that you mentioned, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you say that you measure happiness by attainment? Was that right? Or achievement? Achievement, yeah. 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 Um, do you feel that you're closer to finding happiness now? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've shifted. Like, it's really important for me. Anyone who comes on a, a podcast or stands on stage or in front of anybody and tells them they've all this figured out is lying to you. Nobody, no, nobody's figured this out honestly, and it's and it's it's okay. There's something kind of relieving in admitting that we're all kind of figuring this shit out ourselves as we go along. And it becomes nice to give you five ways to beat anxiety. It's lovely to throw a BuzzFeed article at you and it's grand and it can it can help you in in certain ways. Absolutely. But really, when it comes down to it, everybody subjectively is trying to feckin hustle through this world. And in the worlds of Leonard Cohen, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And I do believe that that we're all individuals. We all have our own subjective shit going on. And 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 for me, when I look back and I look at my own life and I observe it that way, I've started to realize genuinely, I'm not, I don't even call it happiness. I just call it connection and content, contentment. And that's all I'm looking for, to be honest with you, because happiness is fleeting. So is sadness, by the way. So like, that's the beauty is emotions are transient. They change constantly. And for me, my happiness is in connection. I, I, I like people. I really like people. I don't like, I even like yesterday, I ended up having a conversation with a lad in, in, um, in Bray. I was walking through Bray and, I didn't know this lad from Adam and I just got chatting to him because he had a dog and it was, it was like a 10 minute chat and I actually felt warm walking away from it. It was just, just an interaction in my community and my partner, my dog, my mother and father, I love these people greatly and this is what gives me contentment. So I believed throughout my entire life that, that they couldn't accept me or like me unless I was achieving things. 
I couldn't accept myself unless I was achieving things. And the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it. And the more I, I and I think it's important to have goals, to have purpose, mm-hmm. to have drive, to go for shit, to fucking believe in yourself. But don't be blinded by it. Uh, and, and I think that's what happened to me. I got blinded by it. And I just, I, I, I've changed that. And that, and, and in saying all that, I'm, I'm now kind of chatting like, he's figured it out. I still have shit that hits me and knocks me on my hole. And I don't know wh- whether I'm coming or going. I have so much job insecurity. I don't have a job. I've never had a, a I've never had a job where I have had security. I have to go out and hustle and work and figure out how I'm going to pay my mortgage every single week. I have to, and there's some months, there'll be nothing coming in for me, nothing. I, I invest at least 50% of my time in, in my voluntary work with the charity and what I do. But that gives me something too. And uh, But I also, it, there's something of that insecurity that I actually enjoy, uh, weirdly enough. I, I, I don't know why, because it makes me go, I need... I need some element of security in my life, but I actually don't need to be hamstrung by it either. But then saying that I don't have kids, I don't think. And, you know, I don't, you know, I have a mortgage. That's my responsibility. I have a dog that eats more than I do. That's my responsibility. But (laughs) yeah, I think that's what I want people to hear is that, yes, we can all, we can all do cartwheels into your corporate world and we stand on stage and we can give you big lectures on, on how to be, but none of us really know. And all I'm trying to say to people is, there's something heartwarming in that. There's something, and in the words of Elton John, if you're all still standing after the pandemic, fair play to you, because that, that's resilience. That's real resilience. That's the shit we should be talking about. Start empowering people to believe that, you know, maybe they don't need all this self-help. Maybe they're actually doing okay. And I'll leave you with this phrase that actually became the thing that I've used in my entire recovery. By John O'Donoghue, Irish poet and philosopher, he said, there's a place within everybody that's never been wounded. And that's what got you through the pandemic. Not Tony Hulan, not Zoom, not fucking like windy walks on the beach. You did. Whatever's within you got carried you through that. And it's still there. And it'll always be there. So that, that doesn't mean you're not going to go through shit in your life. That's a guarantee. But knowing that there's always that static thing that can hold you up. That's what people need to hear, I think. Amen. Can't can't add anything to that. That was amazing. Um, uh, really appreciate it. Fair play to you for taking the time. It was a fabulous conversation, and uh, we'll 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 pick it up over a cup of coffee soon. Mm-hmm.